Welcome to Digging Deeper, Make Creativity Your Business Advantage. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Today on the program, Paula DeZuti, also known as Pixie Paula, is with us. She is the creative force behind Local Choice Beverages, which is disrupting the spirits industry with celebrity and influencer-driven brands like Tyler Boone's Boone's Bourbon, hip-hop star Booze Badasses Boozy Juice, that's a hard to say thing, and uh, Trina Braxton's Bar Chicks. She also heads up Striped Pig Distillery, but Paula is also the force behind Skirt Magazine and a dozen other projects. So we're going to talk to her about creativity, uh, branding, uh, being the disruptor in the room, and whether or not she gets any sleep. Uh, so we're going to talk to her today on the program. I've also got a little news and a favor to ask of you. Winfluence is out early, apparently. Amazon has started shipping uh, the book. That's two weeks early, so I want to share some fun events coming up and ask you to help me make the book a big hit because, you know, you need reviews and all that good, good stuff. We'll talk about all that after the important stuff. All of that and more is coming up on Digging Deeper. Uh, but first, folks, 100 million Americans each month listen to podcasts. Some of you are listening to the recording of this live stream show as a podcast. For your businesses, if you're at an agency, your clients' businesses, uh, ignoring podcasts as a method to reach an audience is not very smart. But podcasts are hard to find, they're hard to track, and it's nearly impossible to find reliable audience size and demographic information to know which podcast to sponsor, which to pitch you or your executives as guests on, and so on, right? Well, until now. Podchaser Pro is the professional version of Podchaser, which helps anyone find, manage, rate, and follow podcasts. I like to think of it as a flipboard uh, for podcasts. I talked to their uh, CEO the other day, and he says we're kind of like the IMDB of podcasts. Um, but you don't have to clutter your podcast app with a bunch of subscriptions that you never listen to. Uh, Podchaser helps you subscribe sort of on the web and see what's coming. And then you can download what you want to listen to, or you can listen right on Podchaser. It's actually pretty nice. The cool thing about Podchaser, and you know what? I'm just going to hit a button here and show you because I think I've got the ability to do that. And I'm going to click a button and hopefully, let's see. Uh, this is live, folks, and you know uh, me with my user error button clicking, so hopefully this will work. But I'm going to do this, and I'm going to share. That's not the screen I wanted to share. All right, so stop sharing that. See, that's the, the live screen stuff or the live clicking stuff is, uh, is going to mess me up. No, I want the application window and that one. Here we go. I've figured out which buttons to hit now. So let me show you what this th thing is. So here's Podchaser. And uh, I'm going to load my new activities. And this is basically what I, why I call it a flipboard. I subscribe to a bunch of podcasts, but I don't take up space on my phone with all these subscriptions. There's the new Broken Record. I've got uh, the Everything Everywhere Daily uh, with Gary Arndt, which is a great podcast. And so this is what anybody can go do for free. You can go to podchaser.com, sign up for an account, and that's free for anyone. You can just you know manage your podcast life there. But here's where it gets awesome. So if I look at Bourbon Pursuit, which is a podcast I follow, probably one that you know, Pixie Paula also follows too, um, I can come to Bourbon Pursuit. And if I'm a pro member, I can click on this Insights tab and look. Now I know how many estimated monthly listens it has, a demographic profile, median household income, the top cities where this podcast is popular. Obviously, Louisville and Lexington pop up there, but it's big in Chicago, New York, Cincinnati, Washington, D.C. as well. So if I'm a brand manager trying to make a decision on where I want to spend my, my dollars in terms of investing in podcast advertising or doing influencer outreach to podcasters or you know, being a PR person and pitching my executives or my brand to them to talk about. Now I've got somewhere to go where I can prioritize and organize all these things. So Podchaser Pro gives you access to that critical audience information that you need for media planning and buying, public relations, influencer outreach, etc. I've used Podchaser Pro to make recommendations for media buys and sponsorships to clients. I've also used it to prioritize podcasts for pitching guests too, from a PR perspective, to try to be a part of the show itself. So the program is so useful. I actually asked them if I could be an affiliate. I can count on one hand with fingers left over how many affiliate programs I've been a part of in my time. I just have never been real cool about affiliate stuff, but this one I believe in. I think this service and this platform is absolutely useful and, uh, and critical even in today's age where podcasts are a major media outlet. So podchaserpro.com slash falls is where you go to get that information. You can get podcast audience data there and hopefully you will enjoy your experience 
at uh, Podchaser Pro. All right, if you're dialing into the live broadcast on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, you can jump in the comments section there and ask questions and interact with us here on the show. Uh, looks like the engines are running at the station over here on the restream thing. I see Chip Griffin is in from YouTube. He's saying uh, that uh, good morning, and he's ordered a book, and that's awesome. And and he also made, made fun, as he always does, trolling me with my uh, clickety-click saying, there I go with improper touching. That's probably accurate, so thank you for that chip. Uh, if you are uh, you know, watching along the show on the live stream today and would like to jump in the comments and say hello, please do so. Uh, I'd lo love for you to just say hi. Or if you have a question for me or for Pixie Paula, when we get into that conversation, jump in there now, drop your comment or drop it while we're having the conversation. I'll do my best to keep on an eye on things and make sure I bring your questions and comments to Digging Deeper as well. If you are watching or listening to the show after the fact and would like to join us in the future, just follow Cornette on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter, or look for the Digging Deeper YouTube channel. I think I've got a clickety-click for that, don't I? Yeah, the Digging Deeper YouTube channel. That's over uh, at cornet.online slash dig deep. We normally broadcast live at 8 a.m. Eastern, 5 a.m. Pacific on Tuesday mornings. You can look for me online at Jason Falls, and you can typically uh, find Cornette at Team Cornette. And of course, the YouTube channel is there on your screen if you'd like to follow up with that and subscribe to the YouTube version of this. Um, also, uh, hello, a bunch of more people are chiming in on the Facebooks over there. Todd Lanham says cheers. He's a Louisville guy, says hello. Josh Glower is here. Uh, and Charles Miller, ooh, formerly with DirecTV, now with MSG, Madison Square Garden, just chimed in this morning to watch the show. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the program. Really appreciate everyone being along uh, for the big show. And now let's actually make it a big show because we uh, want to bring the reason you're here, not me, because you can hear me blab on whenever you want. Uh, but today we have uh, our, our guest. Paula Dizzuti is the CEO of Local Choice Beverages. Striped Pig Distillery and Skirt Magazine. It's almost hard to keep up with the venture she's got going, all the irons in the fire. So our first item of business is going to be to uh, suss all that out and figure out, uh, Paula, do you get any sleep? Well, not when I have to get up for an early morning podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I, I appreciate This is the you. most challenging part of the job. <laughs> I appreciate you sacrificing your, your morning sleep for me. I appreciate that you, a lot. You know what it is? Because I don't go to bed until like three or four in the morning. <laughs> well, that's and so what it Right, and most pre-COVID, you know, I'd be doing out events or out in the evenings and everything takes place, you know, late by the time I finish and break down and, you know, I'm hands on. So I'm schlepping stuff back and forth to the car, getting home, unloading at the distillery. Then I get home and then I might sleep like from four to 10, you know? Wow. And so when it's hard to get out of that habit and during being home at COVID, it's kind of like, yeah, you can make kind of crazy hours. And then when I have to get up early, for some reason, I don't sleep at all the night before. So I, I always try to take afternoon flights because if that's, not, I'll just won't sleep. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Uh, I, I'm the same way. If I have something urgent or critical in the morning, uh, like every Tuesday morning for this show, for whatever reason, I don't go to sleep till midnight or after. Uh, because I'm thinking about it. I want to make sure I get mm -hmm. up and I want to make sure I do this. So my brain run, runs like that too. Okay. So it seems like I could sit here listing off all the businesses and brands you're involved with, and we'd be here for an, a whole hour or more. Why don't you give us kind of the elevator pitch? What do you say when someone who doesn't know any better asks what it is you do? <laughs> I say, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> if I define the businesses, you know, it's like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Um, I, people have said there isn't, a job that I don't think that I could do or that I want to do everything. And I think that's true. I stay, I stay focused to my real true purpose. I identify with that, which is unconditional love and possibility. And so for that, I'm eager to embrace on everything because I don't have expectations of an outcome. I am really creating an outrageous life in, in every moment that I can. And I, I mean, you know, you have good times, you have bad times and I lose track of that passion and I always say it's about your purpose, not about your passion. People always say, be passionate and do what you love and the money will follow and, you know, follow your passion. I'm like, no, it doesn't work. If you know who your core purpose is and I, you can identify with that, then it just doesn't matter what's going on in your universe. It, it, you know, as long as you're identifying with who you are, I could be happy if I'm playing with my grandkids or I'm making rum in the distillery. 
So that's what I do is I stay focused on my passion. Un, I mean, my purpose, unconditional love and possibility. That's and at Local Choice, we created the first incubator accelerator branding company. I entered the space as an investor in technology. And when I looked at the beverage model and the multiple on revenues for branding in that space, I said, you've got to be kidding me. I really need to be all in. And so I bought my job, which means, you know, invested all my dollars in, into a company and learned um, how the, the business operates. And I recognized coming out of finance and real estate, originally that it was really nothing more than a real estate play and if you can take some saturation and shelf space then and be sustainable you've got it made so i first started in the investment company as an executive brand manager and i had over 38 brands come across my desk in the first year and honestly i only know of one that's still alive now of course that was over a decade ago but still it just shows the trajectory of most brands you know 99 percent of them are going to fail and I literally had this knot in my stomach about figuring out how to create something that would give these people so passionate about chasing their romance and their fantasy and their desire to launch a brand. But the learning curve was so steep and the regulatory work is ridiculous. So I said, there's got to be a way. They're all doing the same thing. And I was watching them all running around with chickens without heads. Right. And I said, if I could just create nobody knows what anyone's doing they're all duplicating their efforts there's such waste and so i said there's like i do with everything else you know i i hey i was selling cable partnerships trying to convince people that cable was one day going to be a thing let me tell you that's how far it goes back <laughs> to me trying to sell innovative ideas so nice. i looked at the business model and i said geez just make it sustainable for people and if everyone's chasing the dream hoping that diageo or Pernod or constellation or beam comes and buys them why don't i just become diageo and that would and people said you're nuts and i go mm, it's a pretty decent easy model if i'm waiting for diageo to buy me let me just become diageo and so i started the incubator accelerator branding and i wanted to have my own distillery you know, we talked about my multiple businesses and one of my brands, um, Boone's Bourbon. When I looked at my background is I have a lot of music and a lot of celebrity connections anyway because of my past. But I, I said there's got to be a way to promote on the same marketing dollar the artist and the spirit. So I created this play called Music, Media, and Magic. I said it's really like a 360 deal back in my agency days for, for these celebs. And, and artists, and now it's not even celebrities, just influencers, right? So people with high visibility. Now, I got to tell you this. I When I started preaching my mission statement back in 2010, right? I first got into the business 2006, 7, and 8, prior to the iPhone, right? And I'm saying, hey, we should create these these um, common platforms where we could bring everybody together and they could all promote and push each other's products and they'd all be on one platform and they'd be able to share in each other's successes and more of those people coming together as a whole would drive a brand quicker and they looked at me like I was crazy, right? Here we are, um, you know, it's science imitates art or whatever they say, right? <laughs> all the science fiction movies always come true. So here we are and the dawn of all these technologies to do this. And that's what we do. So we we launched, um, you know, Tyler was out there strumming away and he wanted his his spirits brand. He is a hustler to the max, all of my partners. And they, um, I said, okay, let's go, let's move this model, not into an endorsement model, but an enforcement model. How can I get brands out there where I control the distribution because I'm either booking the artist or booking the event or doing a collaborative partnership with the people who have the ability to move numbers and numbers of cases. And so that's pretty much what our, what our model is sharing those relationships and, and taking the risk out of their branding. So take me through how you develop a new brand like that. Do you start with the spirit or do you start with the influencer and kind of build the spirit around them? I really, it, it can go either way, but it primarily if an, if a celebrity artist, influencer, and just somebody with a dream comes to me and says that they want to do something, less than 10% of them have a real clue about the industry, right? And that's what makes our platform so valuable to them. So I will say, well, what do you like? 
because I want you to be able to purposefully talk about the product. I really do believe that the brands that are meant to be market leaders are gonna come from the people who are meant to be leaders. And so I want them to have something really great to talk about. So it's like, what are I try to find out what are the things that excite them? How, what was their first experience maybe with alcoholic beverages? Or now we do all beverages. We also do non-alcoholics. And we're launching some incredible water technology. Stay tuned on that. Um, we... So I get a feeling for what they're really most familiar with and what the stories are they like to tell. Because if they can naturally tell the stories that they already love, that they inhibit, then it'll be easy for them to sell the brand. And then I say, well, why don't you can you know consider doing something like this? And then when I get that information out of them, I can make suggestions on what I think will actually make it in the marketplace or the pros and cons of if somebody says, okay, I want to do... Um, I'm just making something up, some some crazy leaf that comes from Zimbabwe. And I say, okay, well, getting that and putting that into a recipe and the whole import export of that and having it get caught up in customs, you know, so I try to just guide them to what's the most practical, but I really do come from their heart first. That's great. Now, striped pig is a different animal, pun intended. Uh, it, it's, it's not necessarily connected with a celebrity, but it does have its own story, right? Tell us a little bit more about that. It does. And I, you know, I, I can't wait. Hopefully, here we go. I can't wait until this story really becomes very recognized. But back, you know, before the 20th and 19th century, 17, 1800s, and the 15 Gallon Act um, was en enacted to prevent purveyors, or so the government thought, from buying large volumes of alcohol. So they enacted what was called the 15 Gallon Act to force the retailers to have to be able to buy 15 gallons of alcohol at a time. And they thought, okay, this will, no one will have the money. So this will cut down the consumption and the purchase and the resale of alcohol. <laughs> so this group from uh, Massachusetts, a, a husband and wife team came up with the idea. I, I say she really prompted the, the circus show of, hey, you know how, we could do this. We could create a circus with a striped pig and we could charge a nickel to see the striped pig. And then everybody would come in and be escorted through the speakeasy once they paid their nickel and get down to get, you know, a drug of rum. And it became, they, the reporters would show up watching, like, how did she figure out how to afford all the alcohol that she was affording? And they would. They said it was a rare curiosity for them to see people walking in to see a pig and stumbling out and about. <laughs> and that symbol became a political cartoon. It became the caricature for recognition of less tax reform, less government control, more consumer uh, spending. And if you look up U.S. history and the striped pig, you'll see that striped pig in all the political cartoons. So I said, this is like great, we're keeping this name. And here we are, right, a couple hundred years later, after going through prohibition even, um, and Corona, and, and it's still about less government control, more consumer spending, more consumer influence. So I think it's awesome. Very nice. Checking the comments real quick. Just saying hello to a couple of people. Missy Perry says hello. And uh, Sean Ray is also here. Uh, Todd Lanham asked Tyler as in children. No, it's Tyler Boone. Boone Boone's bourbon is who, who we're talking about there. Um, if you have a question uh, for Paula, uh, jump in the comments wherever you're watching there and, and throw those in there and I'll try to get to them as we get through this. So I would imagine, Paula, that the biggest problem newer brands faced uh, face in the spirits industry is distribution. Is that the biggest challenge ahead for your brands? And are there any roadblocks you've discovered along the way that you didn't expect getting into the spirits business? I don't find distribution to be challenging because I've figured my way around it and I've been in the industry a long time and I have great relationships. So I say it's pretty easy to get when you've been in the, I don't want to make it look that easy, but you know, it's easy for me at this point, 15 years in, it's pretty easy to get products on a shelf. The challenge is getting the products off the shelf. And that challenge is because we can't directly interact with our consumers, yet we have to motivate them and empower them to either click here by now or go to the store and select your product above all others. And you, even if you 
get them encouraged and excited. Sometimes they go to the store and they're distracted by other products, you know, on, on the shelf. So it's easy for me to get it on the shelf. The challenge is always, how do you get it off the shelf? Interesting. So does that then imply that sort of your linchpin in the spirits business is marketing? Uh, yes. And the onset of new, you know, all of everything that we do online and, you know, you've heard content is king and the content development. And actually, um, this whole entire pandemic has really shifted the way that people look at consumers and their interaction with, uh, you know, suppliers. And I think to the better, and it's forcing the change in a lot of state laws just to be able to keep revenue coming in from taxation because it's one of the highly the most highly taxed products out there right mm -hmm. um and it's really changing the way that governance looks at the possibility of opening up to the especially for distilleries to be able to serve the consumer so wineries for years have been able to ship direct to their customers somebody could come in and visit a winery and fall in love with the wine and order some cases and have it shipped home we don't have those options as distillers and so there's been a lot of lobbying. I do active lobbying within each state, but also at the federal level to try and get some of these laws to change. And they're, they're, they're coming, you know? I mean, with what Uber buying Drizzly, it's like, okay, it's coming. <laughs> I'm like, as, as soon as the big boys, you know who they are, embrace getting their online distribution license, it'll be game over because there won't be a way. How are you gonna police these drones? <laughs> yep. showing up on somebody's front door. It's going to be crazy, right? Yep, it, it is. And, you know, smart spirits companies are certainly planning for that. I, I hope that the powers that be and the folks that are lobbying against it, um, you know, the, dis the distributors and the retail chains that are lobbying against it, I hope that they, uh, they see the light here, that this is going to be good for everybody. But, you know, I don't, I don't get into well, politics you know a lot, but that's what I'm, I'm, I'm passionate yeah, about. Yeah. And I think that they're, they're operating out of a false sense of security. I think they think that it's some way to control competition. You know, the retailers for sure, they're off on Sundays. They don't want anybody to have the ability to do things on Sundays that would force them to have to open. <laughs> you know, they've got one day that they've got mm, no competition on Sundays, but I do, I think that it's a, a false illusion because, um, uh, I think it'll encourage everybody would be on a level playing field. That would be pretty amazing. Yeah, that's true. Now I, I know you, you helped direct the acquisition of the old uh, OZ Tyler distillery, which is now green river distilling company in Owensboro here in Kentucky. I'm curious if you have found bourbon to be a little different than the other spirits categories. I've been around bourbon and bourbon marketing for a while now and I have my own opinions on it, but what have you noticed about bourbon that might be different from vodka, tequila, gin, and other categories? Well, first of all, my background is in finance, right? So when I looked at bourbon, especially, it's the, one of the few asymmetrical investments that exist out there. So when I'm recommending it to even my clients as an investment opportunity, it's like, okay, here's the one product that if you buy it and it's amazing, great, you have a couple of options. You could drink it and that gives you some kind of return on your revenue, right? You're spending your money somehow, somewhere to get enjoyment or you can hold it. And if you don't sell it, it becomes more valuable the next year. So if you look at it as I say, liquid gold, right? It's really, it is a liquid asset and truly is a liquid asset. And your worst case with some decent bourbon, although, you know, most bourbons are decent no matter what. And it's kind of hard to mess up a bourbon. They all have different complexities, but you know what I'm saying? They all are also rich in character. And so, um, although I did once, judge an entire contest in Scotland and I marked everything defective <laughs> and they said, yeah, <laughs> that's the difference between a scotch whiskey and a bourbon, right? So they're so different. I was like, no one could drink these. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> if, if you, your worst case is you're going to drink some bourbon. So I love that. That's different than if you're aging tequilas or you're aging rums, you know, you can get a, a little bit of a, a premiumization by the aging process, but not like bourbon. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, so uh, yeah, Chip Griffin uh, chimes in. Oh, I've met, I've have had have had some <laughs> messed up bourbons before. It's like I've had too many bourbons to try to talk today. Um, 
All right, so let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, tell me about Skirt, uh, number one women's magazine in the South, I think. What, what's the editorial position there? Tell me a little bit about that magazine. Yes, so it's a female empowerment magazine for sure. Um, where we'll be celebrating our 27th year in June, which is amazing. And we recently went, we were a print magazine and we had with the pandemic, we went to digital for 2021. And I'm so excited about that because it's really allowed us to reach women internationally, right? And the, the pandemic knows no state lines. And so now we're just open, empowering, and with all of our content development going online, there's much more to share and that's spreading internationally. So I'm excited about having a greater reach. Again, good things that can come out of bad, right? It's like, um, I'm part of Tony Robbins' inner circle, so I'm always reminded to say, winter is my season. Like whatever the darkness looks like, that's your way to shine light, do a quick pivot. We did that in the distillery business too. When this first started, I actually was on a financial trip in, in um, Sun Valley, Idaho, when we got the word from the big financiers that the country was gonna go dark and we were heading for this pandemic. This is before it was even announced, which is kind of crazy. So preparing for that, um, I came home and I said, we need to start making hand sanitizers. We're, we're dumping our wash and all this alcohol down the drain. I said, and then I'm going out and I'm buying bleach and Clorox for cleaning tools. I'm like, we have all the cleaning tools we need. In fact, let's just bottle it out and start making sanitizer. And they were like, what are, what are you talking about? Within two weeks, they were like, hurry up. We have to make sanitizer. <laughs> So we got shut down in Charleston. Well, the, the distilleries never got shut down because they were considered essential, but the breweries got shut down. Mm -hmm. So I quickly went on the news and said, pulled my cards there and said, do not throw away your beer. Bring it over to the pig and we will throw it in a tank and get it up to high proof and quickly turn it around and get it out to first responders. So I, that was, again, being close to your purpose no matter what you're doing. My need to serve and love there. And so we were able to turn bear mash quickly into hand sanitizer and get that out to the first responders in the food banks. That's great. And so now we're still doing sanitizer. That's awesome. So, so I, I want you said something that triggered something in me, you know, your, your, your purpose, uh, which you, you clearly defined up front, uh, you know, is, is really a, a purpose of service. But when I look at what you do, you're also a disruptor. Um, so how do those two things balance out? Because they don't seem to be cousins. <laughs> so so adversity and contrast is the only thing that can make you really feel your true love, right? So for me, I have to, when I get into a space where I'm fighting for something right, I my soul gets ignited about seeing I, I have this intolerance for injustice. And so if I see that something is wrong in a system, it really bothers me. Now, you haven't mentioned this, I don't know if you know this, but I gave birth to nine children. <laughs> and I now have eight grandchild children, my eighth grandchild on the way. And so my kids will say to me, mom, do something, do something. Or it will be like, Pixie, you got this, go do something. Right, there's my magic pixie. Net. So I'm used to trying to right the wrongs. And honestly, this space gives me a platform and so does Skirt Magazine. It gives me that platform to, my two editorial columns in Skirt are, don't skirt the issue and under the skirt. The things that we try to sweep under the skirt or skirt around, those are the issues that really need talking about. And if you can be, brave enough or um, risk forward enough, uh, vulnerable and transparent enough to talk about these things, which I am, then you can really have amazing impact on the people that you're interacting with. So that disruption always lets me know that I'm on my path because that's what I'm chosen to do, right? So if I see something that's just inherently wrong, it's really hard for me to stay quiet. Awesome. Uh, Pixie Paula DeZuti, uh, where can people find you on the interwebs? So most of the social is Pixie Paula official. And, and that's all the 
social across the board and local choice spirits striped pig distillery <laughs> skirt magazine we've got some exciting things coming out soon oh, i'm so excited that's good that's good well we'll we'll definitely be watching i'll share links to all that in the show notes i've dropped local choice spirits and your linkedin profile over there in the comments of the live thing but we'll make sure the others are in the show notes paul i really appreciate your time today thanks so much for enlightening us a little bit uh, about you and the world of the pixie oh absolutely thank you so much for having me i'm delighted Absolutely. Thanks for being here. Pixie Paula, ladies and gentlemen, you can uh, find the links to all, all of her places on the show notes after the show. I've dropped again, the local choice spirits.com and her LinkedIn profile over in the comments section. So great to have her here and get some insights from her on what she's got going. She's got a lot going. Nine, nine children, eight grandchildren and, and uh, 147 businesses. That's, that's a lot. All right. Uh, so next on the show, the book is out. Check this out, kids. There it is. Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand by me, forward by David Meerman Scott. How about that? Got my copy from Amazon on Saturday. Uh, it's not supposed to come out until February 23rd, but looky here. Here it is. And so uh, a couple of things that I wanted to, uh, to share with you guys about uh, the book um, if you don't know this, if you've ever uh, you know talked to someone who's a book author or you've uh, ever written a book yourself or wanted to write a book, you might know this. But there's an importance uh, in the early days of a book's life, uh, especially on Amazon, to not just have one day where it launches, which February 23rd was supposed to be the launch day, so it's already out there. And so I've got some things planned for February 23rd I want to tell you about. But it's really important these days to not just have one day where everybody goes and buys the book once and then it goes away because that's your one hit wonder. You had one day where everybody cared and then nobody cared anymore. In order for Amazon to really care about your book, for it to rise up those sales charts and whatnot, you have to have a steady kind of flow of, of things. So one idea uh, that I, I've had or that I got from a friend of mine who uh, suggested this was... Uh, sending out, you know, to your email list, which I have a very modest email list. Some of you are subscribers to my monthly influence newsletter over at jasonfalls.com. Uh, but instead of sending the notice that the book was out to everybody all at once, I separated out some segments and sent to a few hundred people on Sunday and a few hundred people on Monday and a few hundred people on Tuesday. So sharing that sort of idea for you to kind of make sure that there's a steady flow of people maybe going and buying the book. But it's also important. There's two things here that I want to ask you to do some favors that I want to ask from you. If you haven't bought the book yet, uh, if you want to go buy it today, that's great. If you want to wait a couple of days, that's great too, because again, trickling it out over time helps the Amazon algorithm promote the book and show steady sales and whatnot. It gives it a little bit more life there. But once you do get the book, and I do hope you buy it, I think you'll enjoy the insights there about influence marketing and how I'm saying that we need to reframe how we think about it. Think about influence marketing, not influencer marketing, and it kind of changes your perspective a bit. Um, and I'll be sharing more about that here on the show as we move along. I do hope you buy the book. I think you'll get a lot out of it. But if and when you do, the Amazon review is critically important. The more reviews there are on Amazon, uh, the more likely the book is to be picked up in that algorithm and prioritized in search and go up in sales and all that good stuff. So uh, if you do buy the book, I would uh, implore you to do me a big favor and go write a review. I'm not going to ask you for five star reviews. Obviously, they're better. I would love to have all five star reviews. I want you to review it honestly because I'd love the feedback. And if I've got a couple of fours and threes in there, maybe even some twos and ones, that's fine. That's OK. Um, I need the feedback, but I need the review, the most important thing. So an honest review on Amazon. If you buy the book, that would be fantastic. You can get the book as you see on your screen at winfluencebook.com. It's available from Entrepreneur Press in paperback and Kindle. Uh, I, I don't have a timeline on the audiobook, but it will be available on Audible and uh, an audiobook format narrated by Jason Falls. Uh, so that's kind of fun. Uh, and so I'm not sure when that's going to come out, but I believe it's going to be early March. So the audible version of that book should be available at some point. But here it is. So, so it's like there's the graphic down. The, oh, oh, it's over there. There's the graphic over there. Right. And here's the actual book right here. So it kind of looks the same. 
The book actually has David's name here. David Meerman Scott wrote the foreword. I'm really proud of that. And the graphic doesn't, but winfluencebook.com. It's real kids. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. I will tell you this. If you, if you uh, aspire to write a book, um, I'm more than happy to chime in and, and tell you what my experiences are. There's, there are two things when you write your first book and I've written three now. Uh, there are two things about each book that you will always and forever remember. Uh, the first one is when you open up that package from Amazon or your publisher, if they get it to you before and you open it up, unbox it and you see it real in your hands for the first time. Doesn't matter how many times you publish. That's a pretty cool feeling. The only thing that rivals that is the first time you walk into a bookstore and see it on the shelf. And when you do that, it hits you. Oh, my goodness. This is real, real. Like it's somebody selling this thing. And that's awesome. And I remember the first time I walked into my local Barnes and Noble, which is like two two minutes from my house. I walked in and it wasn't only on the shelf, but they had it like an end cap. They had a display with a bunch of them. And uh, they didn't know that I would <laughs> live two minutes from the store. It was one of the promos that, that uh, the publisher at the time had, had been uh, negotiating. But I walked in and there was this end cap display with my book. And I just kind of stood there and was kind of stunned. It's like, whoa, my son was with me. He was, I think he was five at the time or something like that. And he didn't get it, but he was like, Hey, I've seen that before. You've got pictures of that book at your house. I guess that I wrote that, but he didn't get it at the time. He's slightly more impressed now. When we did the unboxing of this the other day, he snapped a picture to share with his Instagrammers or Snapchatters or whoever he connects with. So that made me kind of happy to see my son actually taking a picture of the book. But anyway, so the book is out. Um, I've got two events I want to tell you about. If you're interested uh, in the book, of course, it's all about influence marketing and reframing the way we think about that. Uh, the first one is an entrepreneur event. So Entrepreneur Magazine and Entrepreneur Press uh, are hosting uh, me. My editor, Jen Dorsey, is going to interview me uh, on the interwebs here. Uh, on February the 17th, that's next Wednesday at three o'clock Eastern time, uh, you can uh, go to register uh, at uh, entrepreneur.com. Look for their social channels. I'll share links to it in the show notes. Uh, it's a webinar, uh, but it's going to, they're calling it a fireside chat. Uh, and I'm actually going to put a fire in the fireplace. I might even order a smoking jacket and look ridiculous for this thing. Uh, but I'm going to read uh, a chapter out of the book. And uh, so if, you, if you're not if you're on the fence as to whether or not you want to get it, you can come and listen to me read part of it and say, ah, okay, I want to hear the rest of it. So that's good. That's uh, Wednesday, February 17th. And then my big plan for launch day is ridiculous. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be a version of this, but with a bunch more guests. That's going to be the book launch talk show live on February 23rd. That was the original launch date for the book. Uh, even though Amazon's already sending it, uh, that's the still the official launch date. 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 8.30 a.m. out on the Pacific Coast. Uh, for, so from 11.30 to 1, I'm going to have a, a, a cacophony of guests. Co I don't know what that word is. I'm going to have a bunch of guests. Uh, David Meerman Scott, who wrote the foreword for the book, will be with us. Eric Deckers, my original co-author from No Bullshit Social Media, will come by. Tabitha Hawkins from the American uh, Institute of, uh, or American, the Association of Influencers and Content Creators will be here as well. Uh, Gary Krebs, who's my agent, uh, comedian Josh Schneed, and the big selling point of the whole thing, you're going to want to watch the whole thing through because my mom will come on the show and talk about me in ways that I have no earthly idea what she's going to say, but I'm sure it will be fun. Um, she's always entertaining and always is wearing something ridiculous. May she might even be wearing her big hunter gunshot headphones that she uses to keep noises out while she works, which is just fun to see her do. But anyway, Mom will be on the show. You guys will love that. For those of you who have seen my mom before, uh, she's a hoot. So that'll be fun. And that's, uh, again, uh, the, the live reading is next Wednesday. And then the following Tuesday is uh, the February 23rd book launch live show. So, uh, again, you can get the book if you're interested at winfluencebook.com. Uh, it's, it's a, a big deal to have people go buy it. It's a big deal, big deal to have people review it. So I certainly would appreciate that. And now I'm rambling on and beating you over the head with my book, which is not what I intended to do. So there you go. 
Okay. Uh, let's see. What if I've got all these notes about talking about the book. I don't need any more. I think we're here to the end of the show, which we probably ought to let everyone get to work today on a Tuesday. Next week on the big program, David Armano will be with us, everyone. He's just moved on from a long stretch leading creative efforts at Edelman to a new role as the chief marketing officer at Suzy, which is a B2B software company disrupting the consumer market research space. So we're just having a series of disruptors here on the show. So you agency and brand folks who geek out over consumer insights are going to want to dial that in next week. David is also an OG social media and PR blogger. He's got a lot of history and insights into consumers and in the market today. I'll be asking him about all sorts of things uh, next week. David actually just recovered from a, a pretty brutal battle with COVID too. So we'll get some insights from him on, on that uh, as well. So David Armano used to, uh, his blog was called Logic and Emotion. If you were around in the mid 2000s, looking at PR social media blogs, I met him at a blogger event back then. And he, he's like a rock star. Like he's like leather jacket and shades, rock star. He's super cool. And so he'll be on the show next week. Good to have him with us. That's next Tuesday, February 16th, live at 8 a.m. Eastern, 5 a.m. Pacific. It'll be live on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitter. Or later that day, you can listen to it on the podcast feed. To get that live stream, by the way, where's my buttons? Here we go. Uh, you can follow Cornette on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Me on Facebook or Twitter. Or look for the Digging Deeper channel on YouTube. That's at cornette.online slash dig deep. The recordings, of course, will be on your network of choice afterward uh, if, you, uh, if you miss it. And then you can also subscribe, by the way, to the audio podcast, uh, which is at cornet.online slash digging deeper. So spell the whole thing out and that'll get you to the podcast page where you can subscribe on Apple and Google and Stitcher and Spotify and all those places. We're on all of them, I believe. Uh, so wherever you listen to podcasts, you can listen to the audio portion of the show so you don't miss anything. And I would really appreciate you doing that because I don't want you to miss anything because we try to bring in some good, smart folks like Pixie Paula, who was here with us today. So there we go. All right, now we've reached the exciting port of the show where Jason has to hit a bunch of buttons in the right order to get us out of here. And you know I screw this up every week. So let's see if I can do this again. I got to hit one. I got to hit two. And then here's another one. And if it works right, then I'll be able to read the outro. All right, here we go. Ready? Three, two, one, go. That'll do it for this edition of Digging Deeper. Make creativity your business advantage. If you like the episode, share it with a friend or colleague who might as well. If you or someone you know would make a good guest on the show, email us, jason at teamcornet.com. Digging Deeper is a production of the Cornet Group. Find us online at teamcornet.com. Our executive producer is Christy Heiler. Creative director Jason Majeski. Associate producers include John Hurston and Ashley Harris. Our theme music is composed by Rex Banner. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Until next time, folks, I'll see you on the interwebs. <laughs>